In the ancient Greek world, the Oracle of Delphi, located 100 miles northeast of Athens, was considered the center of the world. People from all over the empire flocked there to consult the high priestess of Apollo, the Pythia, and have their future revealed. The answers that she gave determined the future of individuals and the fate of empires. Delphi was situated on the southwestern spur of Mount Parnassus in the Valley of Phocis. It was claimed to be the dwelling place of the god Apollo. Greek legend relates that the hill was guarded for many centuries by a giant snake called Python, which was a worshipper of the cult of Gaia, or Mother Earth. But then Apollo swept in and killed the snake to claim Delphi as his personal sanctuary. It appears that the legend has some basis in fact. Between the 14th and 11th centuries BCE, there were villages in the Delphi area that were settled by worshippers of Gaia. Then, over a 200-year period, they were supplanted by worshippers of Apollo. By the 8th century BC, the Pythia had gained international renown as a revealer of divine truths, directly from the great god Apollo. Pythia was the title given to the woman who occupied the position of high priestess of Apollo. The word Pythia comes from Pytho, that being the original mythical name of Delphi. Most of what we know about the Pythia comes from the first century CE writer Plutarch, who served as a priest at the temple at Delphi. The Pythia had to be a free-born citizen of the town of Delphi. For the first few hundred years, the Pythia had to be a young, unmarried virgin who would dedicate her life to being the Pythia. This apparently changed when a man who was brought to consult the Pythia tried to seduce her. From then on, she had to be a post-menopausal woman over the age of 50 who lived apart from her husband. She was required to dress in the style of a maiden, including wearing a veil. In keeping with the virginal theme, the Pythia would wear a simple white tunic. Plutarch described the character of the Pythia as follows. She who now serves the god has been born as respectably as any man here and has lived as good and orderly a life but having been reared in the house of small farmer folk, she brings nothing with her from art or from practice or faculty whatsoever as she goes down into the sanctuary. As Xenophon thinks that the bride should step into her husband's home, having seen as little as may be and heard as little, so she, ignorant and untried in almost all things and a true virgin in soul, is associated with the god. From Plutarch's description, we can see that the Pythia was certainly not a worldly wise woman. Her abilities of prophecy came not from anything within her, but from the infusion of power and divine knowledge that she received from the site where she operated. Plutarch also expounded the value of the hallucinogenic vapors that heightened the consciousness of the Pythia. Being raised in Delphi, the Pythia would have been raised on stories about the oracle. In addition, Visitors from all the known world regularly made a pilgrimage to consult the Pythia. As a result, the residents of Delphi would have been more aware of worldly goings-on than most other people. The Pythia only sat for nine days of the year, being on the seventh day of the non-winter months. Getting an audience with her was no easy task. Prospective consultants were required to make offerings of money and animal sacrifices. The priests of the temple would carefully study the entrails of the slaughtered animal and decide whether the offerer was worthy of the Pythia's time. If not, the person would be sent home disappointed, no matter how far they had travelled. Prior to receiving her first consultant, the Pythia would enter into a trance-like state. She would then sit on a sacrificial tripod, holding symbols in her hands that were representative of her connection to Apollo. In her left hand would be a clutch of lavender. This was a symbol of Apollo. Modern day historians have speculated that this may have actually been the shrub oleander, the fumes of which may have helped the Pythia enter into the trance-like state, which was required for her to be able to channel the prophetic answers to the queries of the consultants. In her left hand, the Pythia would hold a wooden bowl that contained holy water. Part of the preparation for prophesizing included bathing in and drinking from the holy waters of the Casotis spring. The trance-like state that the Pythia entered into 
in order to accomplish her prophetic work, has been described by some chroniclers as seizure-like and accompanied by gibberish and wild utterances, as if she were speaking in tongues. The priests in attendance were then said to have interpreted the words in order to answer the query of the consultant. However, these accounts have been disputed by others who claim that the Pythia was in a calm, controlled, trance-like state. The prophecies that the Pythia came out with were often ambiguous and open to interpretation. An example was the prophecy given by the Pythia when the Athenians requested guidance regarding the war with Persia in 480 BCE. The Pythia stated, Far-seeing Zeus gives you Tritogenia Athena, a wall of wood. Only this will stand intact and help you and your children. Blessed Salamis, you will be the death of mother's sons, either when the seed is scattered or when it is gathered in. While some interpreted the wall of wood to be the Athenian Acropolis, which was at the time surrounded by a timber palisade, others took it to refer to ships. This view prevailed, leading the Athenians to conclude that if they engaged the Persians in naval warfare, they would be soundly defeated. Athenian commander Themistocles, however, challenged the Pythia and took the war to the Persians, achieving a great victory. Upon the death of the Pythia, her successor would be chosen from among the guild of priestesses of the temple, assuming the position of the Pythia was much sought after. In addition to the prestige that came with the position, she was exempt from taxation for life, received a salary and housing from the state, along with the right to own property. For a number of centuries, as many as three women served as the Pythia at one time. Two of them would alternate turns at sitting in the oracle's seat, with the third being held in reserve. Even though the Pythia only sat nine days out of the year, the job was extremely exhausting. According to Plutarch, the lifespan of the Pythia was usually cut short as a result of the physical and mental demands of channeling the spirit of Apollo. At the end of a session, the Pythia would be as spent as an athlete who had just completed a momentous physical challenge. The Pythia was attended by two priests who were selected from the citizens of Delphi. Like the Pythia, they were appointed for life. These priests also officiated over other sacrifices to Apollo as well as organizing the Pythian Games, held at Delphi every four years. The oracle at Delphi declined under Roman rule. Finally, towards the end of the 4th century CE, prophesizing at the oracle was officially prohibited by Roman law. The days of the Pythia were at an end. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe. If you have any other suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover, please leave a comment below and we'll see you next time on History Junkie.